Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Riley Ettergenoso, and I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and the Curator at Vulnerable Landscapes. Welcome to the Staten Island Museum. <laughs> Vulnerable Landscapes depicts an island at risk in the heart of the nation's largest city. This interdisciplinary exhibition centers the shorelines at the forefront of climate change in one of New York City's most vulnerable landscapes, Staten Island. This exhibition examines the shared space between the built and natural environment and highlights local individuals advocating for climate justice and a deeper connection to where we live. Vulnerable Landscapes brings together artists, students, engineers, educators, scientists, and community leaders to inspire and connect us to this unique borough. Vulnerable Landscapes is on view until December 30th of this year. And we're excited to hear from some of these artists, engineers, activists this afternoon, James Vincent Bryce, Nate Doerr, Nathan Kensinger, and Sarah Nelson Wright. Moderating today's talk is Idea Reed, whose portrait was painted and commissioned by the museum, painted by Sarah Euster and is featured in this exhibition. Idea Reed is a junior at Barnard College and fights for climate policy as an intern at the Climate Museum. She brings attention to the injustice facing Staten Island's waterfront as a member of the Environmental Justice Coalition and conveys her passion for people and the earth through art as a member of the Young Lords Collective. Welcome, Ida Reed. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming out today on this rainy day. Thank you to Riley for putting this all together. Thank you to Janice, and thank you also to some of you out here. Farrell Thurman, um, who inspired a lot of this work and is a personal inspiration to me and has been fighting for climate justice on Staten Island for so long. So, yes, I am just going to welcome our amazing panelists and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and their work that they have. Hi, so. hey everyone, thanks so much for coming. Let me turn this on. <laughs> Testing, testing. Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming. Uh, my name is Nathan Kensinger and I have um, been documenting New York City's waterfront for the last 15 or 20 years through a whole series of films and photo essays and uh, public art projects. And my work upstairs uh, as public part of Vulnerable Landscapes is um, a series of um, sort of photo essays that I worked on as part of a project for an organization called NYCH2O, where I have been documenting a lot of the wild creeks of Southern Staten Island and um, creating these walks where I take the public out to explore the layers of history on these endangered creeks and wetlands uh, in sometimes very industrial neighborhoods. And what's upstairs is a collection of some of the photographs and writing that I've done really digging into like these unique historical parts of Staten Island's landscape, um, oftentimes very overlooked because they're hidden in people's backyards or hidden in the woods. Um, and so I, I continue to lead these walks and I've created um, numerous different photo essays and story maps that explore these creeks. And uh, I'll be leading, I think, like five more of these walks coming up in the fall, uh, if people are interested. I know Ken has been on almost every single one of these walks, so he could be on the panel describing, <laughs> describing some of these places we visit. But it's really, the intent is to like really get out into these parts of Staten Island that are often overlooked or even like difficult to, to, to access and take a close look at, you know, why they may be in danger and what their stories are. Yeah, thank you to everyone for being here. My name is Sarah Nelson Wright. Um, I'm here uh, representing a collaboration of about eight years with my collaborator, Edric Spontanilli. I'm going to be here today. Um, and uh, I'm a new media artist. I'm interested in using interactive um, technologies in a sort of more uh, approachable and public art mode um, than they usually are used, perhaps. Um, so the project that's upstairs is the Virtual Reality Viewer, um, which Edrix and I designed and um, Edrix hand-built. Um, it's a wooden viewer. Um, it looks kind of like a telescope. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, hopefully you'll take a peek through after the panel. Um, but we're depicting four uh, vulnerable shorelines um, on Staten Island. It's called Shifting Sands. 
Hi, I'm Nate Doerr, and I made a video piece called Specters of Watch Oak, which looks at the northwestern corner of Staten Island, which is largely, it's one of the wildest sections of Staten Island. There's a lot of marshland there still, a lot of it's post-industrial in various forms, or is a post-industrial site that is now marshland again. Um, there's a lot going on there, but the whole project grew out of discovering uh, writings from William T. Davis, who was the founder of this museum, one of the founders. And finding that despite being a scientist and historian who did a lot of important work, he also was really into the mythology of Staten Island. Uh, he wrote a couple of books that are very tied in with the stories and the landscape. So this project began with trying to go to some spots that I identified from his writing and on old maps that he worked with. And then just seeing what was there now and then looking at the stories that emerged from observing the landscape. And during that process, all of the sort of ghost stories he was collecting back in the day became metaphors for the ways we interact with the landscape now, um, contamination and oil spills and climate floods that affect that area. And just all the, the current specters that are in the landscape that are caused by the Anthropocene. Hi there, uh, my name is James. I'm a graduate student at MIT studying uh, civil and environmental engineering and architecture. Uh, so I'm interested in sort of the integration of an understanding of physical processes in our uh, environment with uh, natural processes and how those kind of coalesce in um, how we design uh, our waterfronts. Uh, the piece upstairs that I did is a, a bathymetric model kind of going, uh, cutting a cross section through the coastline, sort of like a, a representative uh, coastline of um, a Staten Island. Uh, salt marsh specifically. And so for me, a lot of my research has to do with understanding uh, the physics of natural systems like salt marshes. So how salt marshes uh, attenuate wave energy, how they uh, filter water, how they store carbon. So there's all these kind of like great physical benefits that we get from these systems, in addition to their ability to uh, provide habitat um, increase biodiversity and also increase sort of social resilience in the form of the, the kind of infrastructure they provide for us. Um, and so I kind of embarked on this piece as a way to um, visualize how some of those processes interact, uh, interact and encourage people to look at the landscape through kind of a dual lens, understanding both the sort of like ecology and the physics. Thank you so much. Um, as you can see, these projects are very diverse. They all tackle um, this issue of vulnerable landscapes. And I just want to ask each of you what the term vulnerable means to you and why you think Staten Island is an accurate depiction of a vulnerable landscape. I'm just going to go first. microphone. got the microphone. <laughs> It's interesting because I think uh, I think there's like two sides to vulnerability. Um, yes, I think Staten Island is particularly vulnerable um, as sort of like looking at, at a social history. Um, it's it's vulnerable kind of in an environmental standpoint. It's some you know a landscape that's been kind of continually developed and in the face of Climate change is, is facing a lot of new changes. Um, I also think, though, that like the other side, I think about vulnerabilities is resilience. Um, so, I guess, I guess for me, I, I would describe <coughs> Staten Island more as a, as a, as like a resilient landscape, um, one that has seen a lot of change, but is kind of also continually adapting to that change. Um, it was really interesting to see kind of the, the different ways that vulnerability has been depicted um, so far in the exhibition. Um, so I'm actually very curious to hear what everyone is thinking. So one of the first locations in North of Staten Island that I was working with was for sort of the prequel to the current product film and stuff here, um, where I was shooting mainly just in uh, Net Creek Park in Chelsea, uh, which is kind of south of the areas that I was dealing with, the Spectres of Wash Oak. But 
very connected and similar to this industrial landscape. There's a beach there you can get to if you cross this, you go this winding little path. Um, but the whole neighborhood's mostly industrial. But when I was researching that and came across Davis's words, I also found that the whole area got inundated during Hurricane Sandy. There was a mall there that got just completely flooded um, and everything, all the businesses around there. So it's a very, very vulnerable landscape. It's the front lines of the storm surge, even though it's on the inland side of the island, uh, still got completely flooded. And then looking into that as well, I found there's been, I think, at least three major oil spills in that part of Arthur Hill that all affected that shoreline. So it just, it's intensely um, on the front lines of everything happening environmentally around here. Um, but also I like what you said about, um, you know, the, the flip side of that, like Mariners Marsh Park where I shot a lot is a completely changed landscape. Like it's a post-industrial marsh that has steelworks and a shipyard there that you can still see tons of remnants of it, but it's completely been reclaimed by nature and, you know, it's a nature preserve now and beautiful. Um, and all, of course, the marshes are also a great resilience feature and they're still thriving in many parts of the shoreline there. Um, so in our project, we picked um, four shorelines that um, have projects, um, sort of human development projects that may potentially um, radically transform them. So um, in thinking about vulnerability, you know, I think about like a vulnerable person is sort of susceptible to you know, being changed or swayed by others without sort of the ability to um, hold steady. So um, the, yeah, the four places, um, some of them have, you know, um, resilience projects um, like the living breakwaters um, and seawalls um, that are sort of post, um, you know, sea level rise sandy projects. Um, and some of them have development projects that, um, one of them is um, a potential future site for um, an industrial facility for um, wind and energy. Um, one may have you know, bus lines. So this idea that these places may radically change. Um, and uh, we were hoping to sort of capture what's there and what's valuable now. Yeah, I guess uh, in terms of Vulnerable, one way of looking at it would be maybe like endangered or at risk. That's that's one way that you could look at the vulnerable um, description of Staten Island. And, and a lot of the places that I have been documenting around the waterfront of Staten Island are certainly at risk, uh, endangered, you know, may disappear. Um, you know, even in the last 15 years, I've seen a lot of very unique green spaces along the waterfront be taken up by development and um, be turned into parking lots or, you know, large uh, Amazon, you know, Amazon trucking facilities. Um, so we're seeing, you know, parts of Staten Island's landscape that have somehow survived for 400 years of European settler colonialism, uh, trying to transform the landscape, uh, now, just now, being taken up by different projects. You know, I think of, like, what happened to the marshland over on Old Place, which, um, or Bloomfield, where they put in this enormous Amazon facility, which is in Natesville, I believe. Um, a million square feet at yeah, it, just yeah. during COVID. <laughs> a million square feet of parking lots, warehouses, um, really paving over what was once a wetlands and um, having an enormous impact there of introducing tons of truck traffic uh, to that part of the island, which was quite wild just up until, you know, let's say seven years ago. So certainly there's a lot of places around the island that are at risk right now, at risk of vanishing because of those kinds of projects, but then climate change would be the larger threat um, because of course, Staten Island being surrounded by water, so many neighborhoods um, that have been built into these landscapes are at risk. And I had a film in the previous exhibit um, at the Staten Island Museum, actually, which is called Managed Retreat, where I looked at uh, the neighborhoods that have been built into some of the marshlands on the eastern side of Staten Island, on the ocean side of Staten Island, and what had happened to them during Hurricane Sandy, and then the process of those neighborhoods being removed and the, the landscapes being returned to a wetland state. So, a lot of different things that are impacting Staten Island right now, but I think climate change and sea level rise are definitely the, the biggest things looming on the horizon. 
Thank you for each of your very thoughtful responses. Um, it's really interesting um, on Nathan's point to think about ways in which Staten Island is naturally vulnerable and how it becomes vulnerable because of human-made things. Um, but I also love the idea of resilience. When you're a vulnerable landscape, when you know you're a vulnerable landscape, you're forced to get creative because you know that you're susceptible to these changes. Um, on the topic of creativity, each of your projects are so creative, and I want to delve into uh, the process each of you went through in creating your project. So can each of you briefly explain what it was like to work on these projects, but specifically um, the challenges you went through? Yeah, cool. yeah the, the work that I have upstairs is really kind of an extension of um, what I've been doing for the last 15 years on Staten Island and, and around New York City, but I've been trying to investigate all of the remaining wild creeks uh, in New York City across the whole, all five boroughs. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, I was uh, investigating these creeks in Staten Island and, and trying to photograph them and hike them from their source all the way down to their mouth. Um, and that, that began probably like 2008, maybe, that I started that process in Staten Island and, and in other parts of the city. But um, really, I, I began digging into the project that's represented upstairs kind of during the pandemic, which had its own set of challenges. But uh, I received a grant to really start digging into the creeks in the southern part of Staten Island and, and researching their history um, in order to bring people to them. And so during the pandemic, I was leading these walks in these really unique landscapes um, where we'd be out in the woods, you know, investigating a wild creek while wearing masks, um, which is a very strange experience where we're like, we're like in the woods, you know, trying to have a, a natural experience within trying to protect each other um, from, from our own breath. Um, so that was definitely one challenge to, to be creating that work during the pandemic. And um, it was fascinating though. I mean, it really was an opportunity to, to dig into some of these creeks that I might have previously known about or photographed and really try to find the, the, their histories. And so that's part of that project, you know, we like unearthed, or not unearthed, but discovered a creek that has kind of been demapped and forgotten about on Staten Island, which is upstairs. It's called Wynant's Brook. And um, the challenge of that one was like trying to figure out where this crazy creek flowed, where it, where it no longer was represented on any kind of map. It's not on Google Maps. It's not, you can't see it on satellite images, really. And the people living around it didn't even know it was a creek. Um, so research this for very forgotten waterway that people, when they heard I was interested in it, were like, what, what is this thing that's flowing past our, our, our complex of townhouses? It keeps flooding our, our backyards. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. We, don't, we don't know what this is. Can you tell us where it goes? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, actually, yeah, it flows all the way down to the Arctic Hill. Um, so that was a challenge, too, really, like digging into places that have just been forgotten in some ways on the, on the island. Forgotten creek within a forgotten borough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some of the creeks are very well documented and well known, and uh, you know, engineered and part of the blue belt. But some of them are just, you know, they've almost been lost to time. Which I think Nate, in his work, has found, you know, these places that are just like not visited by humans at all. Great. So with our work, um, we're trying to capture the perspective of, of landscapes. So you know, you look in and you feel like you're seeing from the viewpoint, hopefully, of these different landscapes. Um, and uh, we've used this viewer to depict sort of a number of different places on themes for for various um, shows. But um, Edrix and I both agree that the footage from Staten Island is absolutely our most interesting and. Um, immersive and evocative footage and we had a really amazing time shooting the footage. It is very funny to shoot 360. We're shooting like a um, basically a 360 degree sphere of video. So um, we have to like run and hide after we set up the camera. <laughs> and um, you know a lot of the landscapes were in dome. You could sort of monitor it if you had like a good cell signal, but you know, you don't have a good cell signal. So we kind of set it up and hope for the best and um, have a lot of fun kind of like squatting behind things. And um, we also are trying to get, you know, 
different interesting perspectives. So of course we're always like going right by the shoreline and then coming back and the camera's like almost underwater. Um, so, you know, those are some of the challenges, but I would say like in this particular project, the challenges were all fun. <laughs> I really love, um, I really love the footage. I love um, the diversity of the four different places. And um, uh, I love the experience of capturing it um, because, you know, the purpose of our project is to kind of uh, give an opportunity for people to spend time in those places and the process of making it is us spending time in those places and coming to appreciate them and really looking around and seeing you know what is valuable and interesting yeah i have to echo that you, ultimately the reason i'm making projects like this is that they let me spend time in places i want to spend time and explore them more fully so yeah but as far as uh, the challenges of making this project, it's a lot of it was down to happenstance because I was working from a map from the 1890s um, that William Davis and uh, Charles Lang created. Uh, and so finding those places nowadays, who knows what's there? You know, it, there might've just been parking lots on all of them and I would have had very little to work with. But I actually found there was a huge wealth of material, just layers and layers of it that were all in those same spots that they were talking about back then. And finding those sort of spectral thematic links between all of those was the challenge as well. And trying to create something that's cohesive that still pulls in all those different themes. Yeah. Um, I, I love an opportunity to walk around the salt marsh. <laughs> um, I, I would say, so maybe the biggest challenge for me, the pieces, um, like a lot of fabrication. Uh, so it was uh, CNC milled out of uh, solid maple. And so to do that, you kind of have to like model um, the, the, you know, topography, topo, the British trees is like topography, um, in some kind of like 3D modeling software. And then you kind of feed that to a big machine and stand there and watch the big machine for hours because you can't <laughs> walk away from the big machine. <laughs> and then um, the, Plexi glass is uh, laser cut um, with like drawings that I did, and so you also have to stand in front of that machine and watch it for a long time. Um, and I did lock myself out of the room <laughs> so, like, while it was running, which was bad. Um, but uh, so, so the fabrication, I think, is the biggest challenge, um, maybe like in a tactile way. Um, but I also think it was also part of the fun because I. I'm very interested in finding different ways to communicate um, and kind of using art as, as an, a way to, to communicate science. Um, so a lot of the time I'm talking about, uh, you know, fluids in salt marshes or oyster reefs. Um, a lot of the time I'm writing about it, a lot of the time I'm drawing it, but I think that there's like a tactile process of making. Um, and, and I also think that that kind of making communicates uh, in, in a different way when you're trying to teach someone something or or have an experience with someone. And so I could talk all about this stuff for hours. If you want to ask me about it when we're in the gallery, I'd be happy to. But I, I do think that there's something about like seeing um, that uh, is a very valuable experience. And I think that's that's what makes um, kind of like working with these ecosystems such a great experience for me because it's very much like in your face in front of you like we see these things all the time um and so i, I was excited to work in a medium that um was very focused on like that kind of like visual communication thank you guys so much um it your passion really comes across when you talk about your projects and i'm glad that some of those challenges were enjoyable. <laughs> um, and now I'm gonna ask each of you a specific question about the project. And I'm gonna start with James because he has the mic. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, in a conversation that we had this week, you called yourself a naturalist at heart. Um, as a native Staten Islander, can you describe how your experience living and growing up here has impacted your love and deep sense of respect for the environment, yeah. if at all. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm just sitting here. Um, yes. So I the the phrase that I like to use. She's referencing it's um I'm a physicist by training and a naturalist at heart because I think 
Um, before actually I went back to grad school, I worked at the Staten Island Zoo um, for a few years. I was one of the zookeepers and then I became uh, one of the aquarists. So I spent a lot of time uh, working with living things. Um, and I also, growing up in the city, I think a lot of time in, when you grow up in an urban area, you don't have the opportunity to experience nature. Um, and I feel very uh, fortunate and privileged that I, I did grow up having that opportunity um, because of the kind of like natural landscapes that I lived in proximity to. I actually grew up when I was younger in Brooklyn. Um, but then also I was fortunate enough to be raised by my mom from Colorado, which is sitting there, um, <laughs> who also kind of took me to these uh, natural landscapes growing up. And I think there's something about like showing someone like even giving something a name like pointing to it and being like oh look a red-winged blackbird that i think is really important in fostering that sense of connection to the the landscape because there's there's wildlife in our cities there are pigeons there are rats <laughs> um but there are also like beautiful chicory that's like sprouting in between sidewalk cracks and so I think if you're not growing up, having those things pointed out to you, um, you don't always see it. And so I, I think a lot of my ability to connect to nature, even growing up in an urban area, has to do with um, kind of being raised and, and having those things pointed out to me. And so that's why it's kind of my favorite thing to, to stop on a sidewalk crack and be like, that's plantain and it's <laughs> edible, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think that's like a really important part of my uh, upbringing. Uh, thank you for that. And also, what I really admired about you when we first uh, spoke this week is that often when we talk about climate change, we talk about how it's going to impact us because it is impacting us. But um, there's a sense of not giving the same respect to non human things or animals or creatures that are not human and how um, our development has impacted them. And when we talk about uh, saving the environment, it's like, because they're impacting us or their services are important for us instead of just, why can't we let them just live and thrive? So you, it just comes across that you care about those living things just because you care about those living things and not for the benefit of yourself. So I thought that was really admirable. Moving on. <laughs> um, so, since you touched on urban places, I'm going to move to Nate. Um, your work centers around finding the stories of different urban places, um, particularly where development makes it challenging to find that landscape story. Um, what makes Staten Island's landscape different from the other urban places that you've studied? And what was Staten Island's story? In your observations? Well, so as a photographer and filmmaker in the city, I've actually worked with Nathan a lot on this. But we've been all over the waterfronts of all the boroughs of New York. And I'm from Brooklyn, and there, there's been such drastic changes recently. The waterfront is so developed. When I first moved here, even just 15 years ago, you no, know, longer than that almost 20 years ago, um, I, you know, there's still a lot of industry around where, and these sort of spontaneous places where you could just wander down to the shore in an open spot and discover a bit of shoreline, even right in the middle of Williamsburg and places like that. And those have all just been completely erased. They, all the, indu all the industrial relics are gone pretty much, unless they've been kind of enshrined in a park where it's just a museum exhibition, not mm -hmm. totally detached from actual labor and the history there. Um, or they're just condos and towers and other things that have completely changed the landscape. So that's true almost everywhere else in the city, but here you can still see a lot more of those coexisting layers. And that's what's so fascinating to me. And that's why I keep coming back partly. So yeah, I mentioned Mariner's Marsh Park uh, earlier, and I just feel like that's an amazing example because not only is it a fairly large nature preserve and wild space, which is rare enough, but it also still has those other layers even from before that. Um, the shipyard and the ironworks, and these layers that were in Davis's texts about the oyster industry around there in Mariner's Harbor, and just all those things you can still find little traces of and draw those parallels. 
or over in the marshlands in Bloomfield uh, that Nathan mentioned, mentioned. Now that's been redeveloped into uh, like a lot of shipping warehouses, this giant Amazon section. Um, yeah, I said they added a million square feet. That was just the warehouse. The parking lots are in addition. So that's even more Marshville. Um, so that's an example where it has changed a lot. But right next, right next to that is Old Place Creek. And you can still walk all the way down to the mouth of that if you find the way. Um, and so those drastically different eras of this, the city and our relationship to the landscape are just right there on view next to each other. Um, yeah, and I think it's hard to find places like that anymore, whether it's natural or historical or any of these other things. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's really interesting growing up on Staten Island and being so surrounded by nature, but then you're also right across this like urban mecca, like across uh, the river. And um, yeah, I feel very grateful that I grew up, grew up around these spaces and feel that connected, that connected to nature, even though I travel to the city to go to school and then um, you're sort of removed from all that and you come home, it's like a breath of fresh air. Um, even just the amount of green that you see around here. And you don't see that often around the city. So it's time now, very special. Um, I'm going to move to Sarah. Um, your work is really interactive. It transports the audience into the natural space without them physically having to be there. Um, what do you think is the importance of this medium, virtual reality, in cultivating empathy for the environment? What do you think the strengths are of virtual reality, and are there any limitations? Um, thank you. Yeah, I think that's kind of the questions we're grappling with when we make this work, absolutely. Um, so when Andres and I started uh, working in virtual reality, uh, it was sort of um, a moment where there was just a big debate about the ethics around virtual reality when you're um, depicting like a person's story. Um, and so we were <laughs> thinking about those debates, right? The idea that, um, you know, looking at virtual reality allows you to place take, you know, be in someone else's shoes. Um, and that can be a really powerful tool for empathy. Um, but then also on the sort of like limitation side, um, you're sort of a tourist in that moment that you can easily leave. You don't, you never experience sort of the relentlessness of someone's situation. Um, so, um, you know, we started thinking about, um, what about sort of taking the perspective of place? Um, and, uh, we've written a bit about, um, this idea of like empathy for place or empathy for landscape. Um, can you sort of be in flow and take the perspective of the landscape itself. Um, and I do think I, I especially love this work in relation to um, like the other works it shows with or the places it shows. Um, you know, I think that it has, it's exciting in, in like the context of, of this show to be able to, to show places in this way um, where you feel like you're there, you know, you've gone and seen a bunch of different art projects about them and then you peek in and like get this window. And I think that that's like a real power and strength of it. Um, you know, I think a limit is also like the sensory part. Like I was thinking about when you asked about the challenges, you know, like, I don't know. I, um, I was, when we were filming right across from, um, Snug Harbor, um, right here. On, on Arthur Hill and there's he's like I think there's a picture of it going through this like, like, twisted old train tracks it's really beautiful and it's actually fall so there's like amazing fall foliage around um and then I saw a rat like run across my path <laughs> and after that I got like very like skeevy and then a lantern fly flew into me <laughs> and um so like the there's a you know there's a limit to like the sort of sensory and like you know, um, the way the air smells and, and tastes and feels in your lungs. And actually, you know, over there, you're like across from like some really heavy industry. So even though in the images, it looks very like sort of natural and, and whatnot, you're kind of like some, there's sometimes there are like kind of noxious smells coming through. And so, you know, the, yeah, there are some, it's not like a full immersive sensory experience in that way. I think that can be a limit, but I think that having that window, being able to go these places that, um, you know, 
might not be as common to to hang out in um, is is an exciting potential of virtual reality. And I like the idea of just um, letting people look at places without people in them and um, just really kind of see what's there. Thank you for that. Um, if you check out Sarah's work upstairs, even though you said there are some limitations with the the senses it is very immersive and you hear all the sounds around you as well you're not just seeing so after this go check it out um so nathan uh your work covers staten island from the industrialized parts to smaller more intimate parts of the island and it is done through photographs as an interdisciplinary artist what do you feel art's role is in combating climate change and these issues that we yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I feel like the other panelists could also have their own uh, responses to that as well. But um, I would say, in my own practice, um, I really made a, a pretty hard shift towards focusing on environmental and climate change issues after Hurricane Sandy, uh, which was kind of an eye opening event for me because a lot of the neighborhoods that I've been documenting around New York City's waterfront were completely inundated by the storm, and in some cases, you know, completely flattened by the storm. Um, and so in the aftermath of that, I really focused on trying to, I guess, as an artist, bring awareness to um, what's happening with climate change here in this urban environment, mm -hmm. and also to kind of considering the future of um, what New York City will be uh, out into the next century or even further, you know, next few centuries. And so, yeah, I, I kind of view my role as an artist in terms of um, engaging with issues of climate change as not necessarily combating climate change, but really um, trying to ask questions, trying to uh, open people's eyes to what's unfolding around us right now and what the possible futures may be. So it's, it's an interesting time. I mean, we're really looking at some pretty massive things happening all around the waterfront of New York City right now to combat rising sea levels and future storms. Um, and a lot of my work is focused on that right now, uh, not just photography, but also uh, I'm working on a film right now documenting a lot of the coastal climate barriers that are being built right now. There's like $4 billion of walls being built all around the entire city. Um, to protect us from the ocean. And so I'm working on a film right now, which is looking at, at the construction of those barriers and, and contemplating what they'll mean for the landscapes that they replace and, and what it'll mean for the future of uh, us being able to live on the coastline here. But um, yeah, so I guess I would say the role of, the, in a more general sense, I, I kind of view the role of artists in engaging with climate changes as, as um, not providing answers, but more asking questions and opening people's eyes to something they might not have thought about. So that's that's what I seek to do, I guess, is really, I, you know, I, I don't have the solutions to, to climate change or sea level rise, or, you know, I don't know what New York City is gonna look like in 50 years, let alone 100 years or 500 years. <laughs> but I think artists can really engage with that and like create kind of imaginative works um, contemplating what it could mean for us. And, and I look specifically at New York City, but I think it's a through, I look at New York City, I engage with the waterfront of New York City, thinking about it as part of this much larger whole, because what happens to New York City is what's happening to cities around the entire East Coast of the United States, the West Coast of the United States, cities around the world are all facing the same challenges that we're facing. Um, so as as it goes in New York City, so, so it will go in the rest of the world. Like if New York City goes underwater, which I think there's a good chance we're gonna be underwater in the next like 80 years, you know, the rest of the world is facing that exact same challenge. And so I think what's unfolding here right now with billions of dollars being spent to try and fight against um, sea level rise and flooding is something that is, you know, of worldwide importance. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess that was a question that anyone can touch on because <coughs> each work, I would say, is so meaningful in engaging um, people with the natural world and 
uh, issues that are hard to talk about. I mean, we've known about the science of climate change for so long. And when you're getting just fact after fact and it seems hopeless, there's not much people can do or will respond to, but art does offer this hopeful space. Um, so thank you. And yeah, it gets people to meaningfully ponder these issues without feeling so um, hopeless and distraught about things, even though there's a lot to feel hopeless and distraught about, <laughs> as we've been talking about. Um, so, Anyone can jump in on this next question, but was there any interconnectedness between the urban landscape and the natural landscape that surprised you? And also, was there any tension you felt between these two worlds, um, between the natural and the human made worlds that you felt wrong? Making you work? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say my project that I would have been working on looking at these spaces in Staten Island is, is all about kind of the tension between uh the human world and the non-human world mm -hmm. so certainly on the walks that i do and in the story maps that it, i have created it's it's trying to highlight that you know it's really like looking at these places that have been shaped by humans over the last 400 or you know, like 10,000 years I, i'm going to take it back to like the paleo indian period um where you can still see remnants of that here on staten island mm -hmm. and and then like what what has that meant for the other species that um exist on the island, in the species of animal, species of plants. Um, and the tensions that I've observed right now are, you know, that it's interesting. You know, we're, we're in a very interesting moment in a lot of ways with climate change happening, with like a lot of development happening in endangered green spaces on the island, but it's also a moment where like all these species are returning to Staten Island and to New York City for the first time in like hundreds of years. So like I go on and take one of my walks through the place where it's the first beavers came back to Staten Island uh, for the first time in over a century. And I talk about like, this is where the beavers returned. I saw them swimming in this pond here. Here's where they built their dam. You know, we walk across where the beaver dam was um, a few years ago. This is down at Richmond Creek in Staten Island. And uh, then I talk about how they've disappeared. And, and I, I don't know what happened to these beavers who somehow managed to come back to the island after almost being hunted to extinction over the last century because people didn't like that the beavers came back and were chopping down the trees that we had since planted um, in, in the landscape and started flooding their houses uh, as beavers do. So I don't know where the beavers are, they've disappeared. And we, so we talk a lot about that, those tensions. You know, it's like the beavers are coming back, but not everyone's a fan. You know, the, there's uh, coyotes coming to the island for the first time in the history of coyotes. Not everyone's a fan of coyotes because they're predators who might eat your dog or cat. But I, we, we're living in a very interesting moment in that sense. Of, um, the, the, the city uh, having reached a point post-industrially where a lot of species are now um, finding green space that they can thrive in. And then within that green space, seeing the tensions of like, you know, how, how can we be in, in New York City, the most populous city in the United States? How can we find our own little corner to thrive? Um, in a lot of the scenes in our, uh, our work and in some of the images here, you can definitely see some of the interplay of human made things and, and natural things. And when we were first developing this work for this particular show, I wanted to call it shore fronts, like fronts, like battle. <laughs> um, and, you know, we had been walking on um, Oakwood Beach and seeing the, the big um, sort of uh, walls of sandbags that are also then sort of bursting <coughs> open. And, um, and uh, recently I was thinking that actually that's not really the right metaphor um, because in a way, it's less of a battle and more of a sort of collaboration <laughs> between these human-made things and these natural things. I don't know if it's a collaboration, but it's sort of like the way they're affecting each other, right? Um, the the human-made things, like these walls of sandbags are, are being sort of um, taken by nature and transformed by nature, and the shoreline is, is being transformed by these human-made things. So I actually think... Um, yeah, I think that, that that maybe is the surprising thing to me is that the interplay is maybe 
I mean, perhaps it is adversarial in some ways, but I think it's also interesting to look at the way that they just shape each other, and you know, the way the sort of twisted train tracks and the trees are now growing together. Yeah, I would say also my work's entirely about that tension and that interconnectedness. That's really what I look for everywhere, which is why I'm shooting here or not. I could, you know, go upstate and find a more pristine national environment, but that tells us less, uh, I think, than the places where we're a human world and natural world are in indirect collision of some kind. But also they're the same world. I mean, we are not separate from nature. We affect it and transform it, but it also affects and changes us constantly. And it's easy to forget, but we're not able to step outside of that, which is why we're the results of our actions of the last decades and centuries are having such a huge impact on us now. That's why we're having to spend all this money trying to, again, reshape our environment drastically, opening seawalls all around the city. And, you know, how long will those even last? Yeah, we're, no matter how much we try to seem separate, we're all part of the same things and these problems will come right back to us. Yes, I totally, totally agree. Um, I feel like, uh, I mean, the word tension is great, um, but I, I feel like so much of my work is about kind of alleviating that tension um, through kind of the conversation about humans and non-humans kind of being like a, a false dichotomy. You know, we there's an ecosystem and we're a part of it. Um, and humans have been living in this ecosystem with other animals for, you know, hun hundreds of thousands, I don't know what human beings they were, <laughs> uh, millions of years, I don't know, um, long time. Uh, and you can, you find those tensions, right? But you, you also find interesting synergies. Um, and so I think part of what's important, you know, we hear so much about, like, we've really messed up the environment. And it's true, it's, it, we have, but we also have done it within the last like hundred years, mostly. And in the span of the earth, that's a very, very short amount of time. And so I think it's important to also reframe the conversation and understand that there is a way that we can live in this ecosystem in a more sort of collaborative way because we've been doing it for hundreds of thousands of millions of years. So this is not just like a, a fact in human society. It's like a blip on the radar in human society. And I, so I think we just need to have, not go back, you know, it's not about going back as, as much as it is about kind of understanding a future where we're thinking about humans, other animals, the ecosystem, the landscape sort of like more holistically. Um, so I do think the tensions are there, but you know, we could also kind of elevate some of those um, kind of mutualisms. Um, just to echo something you said about how we're often told, oh, humans have really messed this up. It's also ignoring the fact that there are humans who have been stewards of the land for presently and have been historically indigenous people have been taking care of the land even throughout all of this industrialization. So yeah, it is important to reframe those kind of conversations and not just thinking about how we've all messed this up and who we can learn from. Um, I have a couple more questions um, for everyone. How can we as people bring ourselves to value the spaces that are invaluable and how can we move away from seeing nature purely from how it benefits us um, and letting it thrive for the sake of letting it thrive, if anyone has a thought on that? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I realize I this is one of the questions that you sent us ahead of time, so in theory I should have an answer. <laughs> but it's a tricky one. Um, tricky one. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think that... It's also okay not to have an answer. 
No, would you just say that last part? Mm -hmm. um, how can we move away from seeing nature just from how it benefits us and letting it thrive for the sake of letting it thrive? Yeah, so this is why this is, I think, a little challenging for me is that though my research is in what is kind of called nature based coastal adaptation. Um, and so this, all these conversations about building up these seawalls, uh, kind of engineering the landscape. Um, a lot of my work is looking at incorporating nature or, or natural kind of base features into these engineering solutions. Um, and so there's a lot of great work that's gone into that, you know, things like living shorelines or living breakwaters is kind of a version of that as well. Um, and I, I do believe in this idea of like, we can kind of be a positive force in the landscape um, and, and engineer something that has these mutual benefits. I think what's difficult is the, is the point that you mentioned where it can sometimes encourage a very mechanistic understanding of what the environment can do for us. Um, so I spent a lot of time talking about all the benefits that marshes give us, but then does it just reduce marshes to an engineering solution? Um, I think, I think for me, it's been about um, kind of having a way to have those conversations in parallel. Because um, on the one hand, I think that being able to see those co-benefits is is something that a, a lot of people can't even see. Um, they just see like reeds and smelly things and they're like this is not a lawn <laughs> it's not manicured it's it's messy like i think a lot of wild space it looks messy to us even when you see like wild like landscape architecture it's very curated like mm -hmm. wild looks mm -hmm. messy <laughs> um and so a lot of us don't like that um and so i i think that being able to see beauty in that has value. And sometimes that is about elevating the things that the environment does for us. But I, I do also, yeah, very, very strongly believe, and I don't know the answer is, but strongly believe that there is like an intrinsic altruistic reason that we should preserve these environments. Um, the first of which probably because we're in it. Um, but, but the second being that you know, seeing non-human um, beings. And it's like kind of hard to, where you draw the line to extend that because I love grass too, like whatever. Um, but sort of the ecosystem um, as something uh, worth preserving. So that's, that's the nuance there that I don't have the answer to. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just briefly add, so as James was saying, yeah, we're just a blip on geologic time. So, I don't know, I think a lot about the, the fact that we're not the end point or the culmination of history. We are a small check, chunk of it that's been around for a very short time and things will go on after us. No matter what we do now, the environment will persist. You might change it drastically, but you know, we haven't, we're not going to write the end of this story. It will go on for millennia and change and reshape and who knows what the dominant species on this planet will be in you know, many millennia down the line. Mm -hmm. And maybe things will be much better, who knows? So I, I think, um, I guess I try to find a, a sort of humility in not prioritizing humans because we aren't that important ultimately. Mm -hmm. We're just part of the story. Um, and you can take that perspective now too. I'm also sort of aware that that's also a privileged position to be able to say, oh, I'm not that important because my needs, my immediate needs right now are taken care of, you know? we're all also struggling to survive and so it's hard to step back and take yourself out of the equation when you're still trying to make ends meet or get food or shelter or anything so i don't have the answer for how to negotiate those two things but i think it's good to keep both in mind in addressing any of these situations um I was thinking about what you said, James, about um, your mother naming the bird and just like, um, you know, I think what Edrix and I are hoping to do with the work we made is just like allow people to look deeply at, at nature or at nat sort of natural spaces as we talked about. They're not really natural spaces, but at, maybe at wild spaces is a good word. 
Um, I was also thinking about this um, sound walk that actually the three of us all participated in creating um, on the Newtown Creek. And there's a section segment where this artist, Catherine Grau, speaks as plants and she basically like introduces herself and then she was like, repeat after me, say my name. So she's like, Puckweed, <laughs> like Virginia, blah, blah, blah. I forgot the names of them. <laughs> it's like the names of all these different weeds and sort of like seeing the weeds. My wart, yes. <laughs> um, seeing all the seeing the weeds as sort of um, just valuable named living beings, and I mean naming things is a cultural human thing. Um, but I think that sort of like seeing and observation and sensory. That's why like you know things like Nate's walks are powerful because people are actually getting out into the landscape. Um, but you know I think that is how we come to value them is like to see them and and to name them. Yeah, a lot to, lot to unpack there. Um, I guess I would just quickly note that like it, really in, in New York City and, and in so many other places where you have such a density of humans living in one place, there, there isn't really that many examples of places that are uh, uncontrolled by us. Like the landscape uh, of New York City is so <laughs> highly controlled that we decide which trees live and die and in the parks, you know, we decide which grasses we're going to allow to grow in green spaces usually. And so a lot of the work that the three of us have done in our own practices is, is trying to almost shift that, that narrative and, and try to find those places that have species which are thriving on their own. Um, with less human control. And it's hard to find that in, in a place like New York City or, or really any intense urban environments. But there are places that exist within within the, the urban environment that um, have species that are just existing um, without you know humans dictating everything about the way that they are. Um, I would I would say I would say that really it's like in post industrial landscapes where humans don't want to be any longer often that you find that and um, the the species are there they like we we do not value them usually because we look at them as like invasive or weedy or you know uh, species that are taking up toxins and and are not good for us but I think those are the species that are in a sense the most interesting precisely because we don't look at them through this lens of like what is it doing for us you know what is this is this tree uh you know helping us with shade is this like you know bioswale that we planted soaking up enough rainwater it's these parts of the landscape where it's like these are the species that are going to survive and thrive no matter what we do and and uh you know i i, I look at those species and i have like great admiration for them i'm like okay like this is you know these are the insects that no matter what we do we can't squash them into oblivion. Um, these are the, you know, the plants that grow in the most toxic environments <coughs> and that, you know, resist even like humans saying like, that plant is invasive, that plant is non-native, we don't like this plant, we have to kill it. Um, yeah, those species to me are, are much more fascinating to highlight and think about precisely because of that. It's like, you survived despite us. Mm -hmm. Wow, <laughs> you guys all gave us a lot to think about. Um, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that Nate was saying that I wanted to amplify, um, it's true that it is a privilege to talk about kind of um, removing yourself from the narrative when your immediate needs are not met and also not every person on this world is equally responsible to what's happening to these landscapes and they're also facing the brunt of the impact so yeah i say people and humans but there are different levels of responsibility that exist and i wanted to um, make that known so unfortunately this is the last question even though this is such an engaging conversation and an important one um, but I wanted to end it on this note. Um, what is one thing that each of you want to see going forward for the protection of these vulnerable landscapes? Mm. And also if you had a pop-up, just one, um, one idea or last day 
point that could offer something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would say within like the Staten Island context, I think there is there is a lot of hope. There are quite a few groups that have been working really hard for decades, or even like newer groups that have sprung mm -hmm. up in recent years to really try to protect um, the green spaces that exist around the island that are endangered. You have like the protectors of pine oak woods, which does fantastic work, really trying to highlight. And, and preserve areas around the island that are uh, threatened by development and, and other issues. Um, you have groups like what sprang up around the, the Graniteville Swamp uh, development issue with, where they wanted to put a, a BJ's parking lot and box store on top of a swampland not too far from here um, on the northern shore of Staten Island. And, and the group that sprung up from that felt like a very organic neighborhood response that was like, no, we see the we see again the value in having this green space here, which is protecting us from storm surges. But they also saw the value in having just a wild space in their backyard and wanted to protect that from, from development. So I, I think in Staten Island, definitely there's these really interesting um, groups pushing to preserve and, and fight for protections of um, some of these remaining unprotected areas on the island. And I see that echoed around the entire city, actually. I mean, really, like every single creek that I've explored in New York City has a group that is their express goal is to like steward and protect that creek and try and like clean it, save it, you know, take out as much pollutions and toxins as possible. Um, I see it in a lot of the green spaces around the city too. There's tons of groups that have sprung up in, in recent years, I'd say in the last decade or so decade, 20 years to, to try to protect like the, the green spaces that we have that have not yet been built upon. Um, and so I find that to be really helpful because it really, to me, talks about like a shift in our perspective on the city where people are like, no, wait, there is a value in, in a place like the Gowanus Canal or the Newtown Creek. There is value in the Arthur Kill and the Kill Van Cull, like, like, like value in the sense that it's a wild space or parts that are undeveloped and should be saved for other species, um, not just for the benefit of humans. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't consider myself a, an expert on Staten Island specifically, but I think that, um, you know, the fact that there are these spaces that, um, you know, where there are traces of art history and then also the natural history, I guess I just hope that some of them are able to just keep um, being without intervention. Um, yeah, as far as that goes, I think one of the biggest things we can do to preserve those spaces is just to give people access to them as they exist right now. Like when I was making my film, I had to tramp through a lot of places that I probably shouldn't technically have been, but they were amazing and beautiful and I learned so much by being there. And I think just opening those spaces up to more people um, is always going to help just get get them to care about them being there in the first place. But also Staten Island, within New York City, it's already a remarkable success story as far as that goes. We have so many more green spaces here. The Blue Belt system is, there's nothing like that elsewhere in the city really. It's mm. such a complete network. and. The fact that you can go into the Greenbelt system and hike for, I feel like an entire marathon worth of just mm -hmm. going into, if you do a full circuit of it, it's an extraordinary number of trails and you can get so far from what feels like the rest of the city. Uh, so yeah, it's really promising that people can get out into nature here so directly from every part of the island and hopefully form a greater connection to it that way. Totally agree with everyone. Um, I, I think, I mean, also like highlighting your earlier point and uh, Dea, like the, the fact is that environmental like issues are social justice issues. Um, and there's like an, an inherent integration between, you know, like there's, there's no mistake that the Amazon warehouse that's, you know, usurped the marsh is now a more vulnerable area because the marsh is gone and I'm, sure the Amazon people that made that are not living in that backyard, you know? <laughs> so um, it is affecting people who are not making the decisions. Um, but I guess what brings me hope is that more and more people are recognizing the intersection of social justice, of 
climate science, of ecology, and I think that this exhibition is evidence of that, um, being able to kind of like look at these issues and these landscapes um, through the lens of art and history um, and science. And so I'm very excited and happy to kind of be a part of, of this kind of evolving conversation. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the end of our conversation. Thank you for leaving us with those ideas. Um, I think we are now opening uh, to audience questions. Um, so if any of you have questions for this amazing panel, you may ask them. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have a question. Uh, is um, the area that you were investigating because I'm we're from Brooklyn, right? We've been here almost 20 years though, you know, and uh, I there's places where I've never been and uh, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, I got lost up by the Gothels Bridge. So is that that Northwestern? Okay. Yeah, it's been so, so I'm on the phone with, I don't know, was it James or Jeanette, my other somebody else, one of the other kids. And I'm like, wow. And I get a charge out of that like that. I I love exploring these places, right? And so this is not really a question, that's the question, but I was up there and I'm on the phone with them and I go, oh my God, and they could tell I'm from New York, right? Oh my God, a fox. And I, <laughs> I saw a fox up there and I was like, you know, growing up as a kid in Brooklyn, I was like, holy, there's a fox, you know? And that's up there, right? That's where that area is. I, yeah. never, I didn't even know they were here. <laughs> Yeah, no, a big part of the process of that film was me going back over and over again, hoping to see this family of foxes who I spotted once. <laughs> well, I saw one. He was walking around along the road there, you know? And then I'll just another little statement that, that, we, that I think speaks to all of this is uh, the tension thing is the classic is the is, is, is a, a video clip that's going around. It's Staten Island and there's all the turkeys and there's a guy in the truck going, Get the hell out of here! You know, so there you go. <laughs> Deer and turkey. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Deer, turkey, coyotes. People didn't like the beaver. <laughs> Being overrun by deer. It's <laughs> swimming from New Jersey. Yeah. yeah. That's because, I mean, it's, yeah, I talk about it on the walks I do, but it's like the deer have overrun Staten Island because we made such a beautiful green space that they treat like a salad bar, you know? <laughs> 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 of course they want to be on Staten Island. They're like, this is amazing. There's no bears or like, wolves that are going to help us. This is paradise for the deer. I, I, I don't consider myself like a practicing artist as much. I do art. Um, for myself a lot of the time, I think I maybe design more uh, professionally. Um, and so it, for me, working in environmental um, issues, environmental science is like my motivation mm -hmm. for, for the art kind of, not maybe not exclusively, but I do think that it's given me like a, a real drive to um, use art to communicate uh, these things. So, so I'm very excited um, to kind of continue to, to delve into seeing the potential of, of art to bridge some of these gaps. Thank you. Are there any more questions? I think that people want to also have us talk about our work upstairs too. Oh, work, that's uh, true because we all should go up there and look at these yeah. amazing projects. Yeah. Um, right. so. Yeah, I'm sure we'd all be happy to talk specifically about the works upstairs if people want to look at the exhibit and, and ask questions there, or just be in conversation. Um, we, can, we can point at point the different things that we talked about on the panel. Can we give them a great yeah. hand? <laughs> Thank you so much. I had an amazing time. I think everyone had an amazing time listening. Um, and I think we should all go upstairs and do these works now. So. And thank you, Dan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you.